Welcome back, American Lit Scholars. Today, we are going to be studying the work of former poet laureate Joy Harjo. She was our first Native American poet, uh, served from, 19, from rather 2019 to 2022. Um, we're talking about a couple of her poems, and I like bookending the, the semester here with uh, Native American poets, because I start off American Lit 1 with the Native American trickster tales, which was our really our first indigenous, our first American literature. And it seems fitting and proper to end with these three authors, Joy Harjo, Sherman Alexie, and Louise Erdrich. Now, this is a picture of Miss Harjo from earlier on in her career. Um, fascinating writer. Uh, she's an excellent uh, poet laureate and an excellent poet. I hope if you haven't had the time yet, if you haven't taken the time, please go and listen to the videos from um, from you that I posted on Blackboard from her reading her work from YouTube. Joy Harjo was born in Tulsa, Oklahoma, to a mother of mixed Cherokee, French, and Irish blood. She's been described, um, she's described her father's family as members of the Creek, also known as the Muscogee tribe, as uh, rebels and speakers, among them a Baptist minister, Harjo's paternal grandfather, two painters, her grandmother and aunt, uh, and a great grandfather who in 1832 led a Creek rebellion from their forced uh, against their forced removal from Alabama into Oklahoma. So there's an Alabama connection there. Uh, as the critic Laura Catelli has pointed out, the work of many contemporary Native American writers is a large, uh, a large number of whom are of mixed blood, enacts a quest uh, to re-envision and identify by confronting the historical, cultural, and political realities that shape the uh, lives experienced between different worlds. Drawing on a family tradition of powerful speaking, Harjo participates in a search to reimagine and repair the painful fractures in contemporary experience between the past and present, between the person and the landscape, between the parts of the self. Thus, traveling is a mythic activity in her poems, enacting this search for community and historical connectedness. As in this work, uh, as in the work of James Welch, Simon J. Ortiz, and Leslie Marmon Silco, the theme of traveling in Harjo's poems resonates with the historical displacement and the migration of the native peoples, especially the forced removal of the Creeks. She has called herself the wanderer of her family, and her poems often map her journeys, whether on foot, in the car, or in a plane. Perhaps Harjo thinks of herself as the family wanderer because she left Oklahoma to attend high school at the Institute of the American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, New Mexico. In a way, it saved my life, she has says. Since her senior BA in the, uh, from the University of New Mexico in 1976 and an MFA from the University of Iowa, she has taught at the Institute of American Indian Arts, Arizona University, and the University of Colorado, the University of Arizona, and the University of New Mexico. So let's take a look at some of her wonderful poetry. And also, she is a jazz musician, saxophonist here. Um, so our first poem that we're going to be talking about is Call It Fear. Now let's take a look here. Here we go. There's an edge where shadows and bones of some of us walk backwards, talk backwards. There's this edge, call it an ocean of fear of the dark, or name it with other songs. Under our ribs, our hearts are bloody stars. Shine on, shine on, and horses in their galloping flight strike the curve of ribs. Heartbeat and breath, back, back, sharply, breathe backwards. Okay, a heartbeat and breathe, rather. Okay which is a, a very visceral image, talks a lot about the experience of fear, you know, the feeling of like your heart, like a galloping horse, uh, striking against your ribs and the heartbeat, breathe and breathe back sharply, breathe backwards. Okay. And she says, there's this edge within me. I saw it once an August Sunday morning when I hadn't, when the heat hadn't left this earth. And good luck, sat, sat sleeping next to me in the truck, and we had never broken through the edge of the singing at 4 a.m. We had only wanted to talk, to hear any other voice, to stay alive. And there was this edge, not the drop of a sandy rock cliff, bones of volcanic earth into Albuquerque. Not that. 
but a string of shadow horses kicking and pulling out of my belly, not into the Rio Grande, but into the music barely coming through, Sunday church singing from the radio, battery worn down, but the voice is talking backwards. Okay. So there's a lot, this is heavy on imagery, and there's a lot going on here with this. Um, he says there's, there's this fear in most of us, and this is the, what the first stanza establishes. There's a fear in all of us, and most of us, where um, this, this part of it wants to retreat. It's walking backwards, right, under our ribs and our heart. Um, and she says, and there's a fear in me. I saw that fear once of a Sunday morning in August when it was still hot. Right? August, uh, you know, the end of summer and the heat. And uh, he said, we've never broken through the edge of the singing at 4 a.m. I'm not entirely sure what that represents. Maybe that's, uh, there is church singing in there. And in the poem, you know, you have her finishing out with, with a Sunday hymn. He says, um, we'd only wanted to hear any other voice to stay alive. Right? So you get the sense there's the, that she's traveling here, and they pulled over to the side of the road, and there's this loneliness and maybe a strandedness, and you want, she's looking for the sound of, of just, you know, human voice, like you're when you're traveling alone at night, and you're maybe in a far distant place, and you're just searching for the for song on the radio, some some connection with humanity here. And he says, it is. she says, um, um, and there was this edge, and again, the, the edge represents the fear, not the drop of a sandy rock cliff, bones of volcanic earth into Albuquerque, not the fear of falling, not the fear of a drop off or, or an ebb, not, not that kind of edge, but <clears throat> a sting of shadowy horses kicking and pulling me out of my belly, right, and the sort of sense here that said the shadowy shadowy horses um there comes a bit of a conflict to the uh, the church singing here maybe this is a collection this is a conflict between two heritages her you know her baptist grandfather the the uh religion whites versus the um the her desire to be who she is and not be you know, trapped in this in this particular structure of who she's supposed to be. Sunday church singing from the radio, battery worn down, but the voice is talking backwards. Right? So in the, and I think in that last line, there's this conflict, this beautiful tension between the Sunday singing, you know, which comes from her, her mixed culture, the, the, um, the whiteness, the, um, the Irish and the portion of her blood, versus the um, the voice is talking backwards. That is, perhaps her being drawn back into her heritage from before. So this, this, there's this this great tension in these last two lines there, and it's all found in the imagery. Okay, so let's take a look now at White Bear too. And remember what our um, intro told us about the idea of conflict and travel and that sort of thing says, she begins to board the flight in Albuquerque late night, but stops in the corrugated tunnel, a space between leaving and staying, where the night sky catches approaching herself from here to there, Tulsa or New York, with knives or cornmeal. All right. And it's just a small space, that little paragraph, there's a lot going on here. We have the, <clears throat> excuse me, um, she begins aboard a late night flight to Albuquerque, and that's you know that's New Mexico or out west. That's where she went to went to school. But stops in the corrugated tunnel, in the space between leaving and staying, which is a great image of itself. You know, you have the airport, and then you have the plane, and in between you have this little narrow passageway that extends out there. And you think about it; it's kind of a liminal space. You're neither where you came from or where you're going. You're just kind of stuck there. And if you think about it, you, it's kind of a place between worlds. And that's where the speaker in the poem is. She's somewhere between, um, between here and there. She's approaching herself from here to there. And that approach can be the two sides of her nature, the, the split heritage. You know, Tulsa or New York, right? The West or, you know, the West, um, Tulsa, Oklahoma, where the, where the reservation is, where home is, or New York career is work. You know, the last flight someone talked about 
how coming from Seattle the pilot flew a circle over Mount St. Helens. She sat quiet, but had seen the eruption of the earth beginning to come apart as in the birth of violence. And you have the sense of being, you know, being torn from where she is, torn from um, what is familiar, what is natural, like a, a uh, like the, the earth is upheaval. But there's also something good that comes from her birth here. And then she goes on to say, she watches the yellow lights of the towns below the plane flicker and fade and fall backwards. Somewhere she dreamed there is a white bear moving down from the north, motioning her paws like a like a long arctic night, that kind of circle, and that whole world balanced in between the car of ebony and the ice so hard. And you have the sense here too of being stuck between worlds, and between being a creature of two worlds. Not just destinations, but the destination of the soul and the spirit travel of the soul. We are, we are um, two things. We are a physical being and a spiritual being. She is uh, shares two heritages and there's a sort of fractured nature that she's, she's having to contend with. here. Um, and she says, the clear black nights like her daughter's eyes and the white bare moon Cupped like an ivory rocking cradle, tipping back, uh, tipping back it could go either way. All darkness is open to light, yeah. which is this beautiful, um, kind of perfectly symmetrical line. There it pulls it all together uh, with this this kind of truism here that um, that that it can always go either way. That all darkness is open to light and. Perhaps the the alternate is true. So, um, really great thought provoking poetry here. A um, little hard to wrap your head around, but uh, you know it's it's amazing work, and um, I think she's an, she's very much a vital and important writer. And I'll leave you with this quote: All cultures and peoples turn to poetry during times of celebration, transformation, and challenge. Those times when ordinary language cannot carry meaning beyond our understanding. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is Joy Harjo. I hope you enjoyed her work, and I'll see you in the next video.